Welcome back to another episode of That's Business. Today's guest, Samantha Burmeister, writes really good copy. So Samantha, thank you so much for being on this podcast. I was laughing when you sent me that in your bio. So we're just going to keep it short and sweet. (laughs) As a copywriter and as the CEO of your own agency, did you always know you were going to be a writer in some way, shape or form? Or what did you air quote want to be when you grew up? Or what was your childhood like? Honestly, I did not want to be an entrepreneur. I did not necessarily want to be a writer because to me, so my dad owned a brick and mortar business in a small town in Iowa and I saw it and I was like, that's cool. And I didn't see it as a freedom business because he was married to his appointment book and he was a great and present dad. And I just looked at it and I was like, well, that doesn't look as fun to me. Like he has to go after hours and like take out the trash, you know, so- That's what entrepreneurship meant to me as a kid, and it therefore wasn't something that I thought I was going to do. Now, as far as writing, I also never thought that I would make a career of it, but it was always a creative outlet for me. So it definitely snuck up on me. It snuck up on you. I love that. I feel like a lot of people very rarely or it's, yeah, I didn't really know I'd be an entrepreneur. I never really thought of it. So that's a great story. And especially seeing that growing up, because it is true. It's I come from entrepreneur parents and you are married to that appointment book. Great point there. So as you grow up, high school, after school and all, when did you even hear about copywriting? Because I feel like I didn't know about it till way later in life than I care to admit. You know, same. I was already a copywriter (laughs) before I realized I was a copywriter. So I feel like there are like three questions wrapped up in that. So where did it start? So in college, somebody gifted me the book, The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. And I think there's a lot of good and there's a lot of controversy in that book. That's fine. But my takeaway from it was that I don't have to do it the same way that everybody else has always done it. That there's a lot of ways to automate and decrease the amount of workload that a person has, whether they're a corporate employee or an entrepreneur. So I read that in college, always had it in the back of my mind. And I also studied abroad in college, which lit the fire under me to continue traveling. I realized I had a goal of visiting every country while I was in college. Wow. Not visit every country while I was in college, but right. I realized the goal <laughs> while I yes, was in college. Yes. So those two like mindsets combined led me to a career in sales because as an American, I had a ton of student debt and no real idea for like what to do as an entrepreneur. Like I went to Iowa State. It's not like I went to Stanford and was surrounded by the Facebook guys. Like <laughs> I all mean, these opportunities. Right. Right. I it was a great school to go to, but I feel like when I graduated college, the options were like tech entrepreneur or like you sell t-shirts. There wasn't a lot there for me. So I continued into a sales career and then continued traveling and through those travels started a travel blog. And I was blogging really just to send stories to my family because everybody's like divorced and those who aren't divorced suck at communicating. Yep. So it was a good way to just blast my stories to the people who were asking about them. It picked up some traction and I was doing some blogging, not really making money, but had a little traction. So when it came time for me to quit my job back in 2019, I was ready. I was done. I was blogging and a lot of people knew about it. So I reached out to people and said, hey, you know, I had this career in sales. I'm a free agent now. Not really sure what I want to do. Let me know if you have work or jobs or ideas for me. And every person responded and said, can you write my website, a sales page, some emails? It was all writing tasks. So then a year or so goes by. It's 2020. I was living with a group of digital nomads. I told somebody what I did and they're like, so you're a copywriter. And I was like, I'm going to Google that word. (laughs) Then looked it up and I was like, oh, okay. So what I'm doing, there's a career path. I was just following the money, following the dream. That's where I landed. And it turns out there was a word for it. So that's a long answer to your several questions, but I think I covered them. Yeah. And I, the ADHD, like I told you before we started recording, sometimes I don't remember when I even ask you, but I was like, yeah, sounds great. (laughs) Now, digital nomad. Yeah. This is a term maybe someone that's listening may not know what that means. So explain what a digital nomad is. It's just somebody who works and is location independent. Um, So you can be a digital nomad. I know people who are digital nomads and they spend 12 months out of the year in their RV, but nine months out of the year back home in Wisconsin. 
that's just what they want to do. So then they travel to other places for three months, maybe a month in Florida, a month in Georgia, and like kind of follow the weather. And that's what they choose to do. I know digital nomads who are constantly flying by the seat of their pants and traveling wherever they want to go. I know people who home base in Mexico or Bali or South Africa. For myself, what that means is from 2019 to 2022, about every one to six months, I would move to usually a fully different country. Part of the reason for that being visas. And then in 2022, I started spending about half my time in the U.S. and half my time outside of the U.S. So I'll do like winter. I'll travel to like a new country every month for three or four months and then come back to the States and then do some traveling within the U.S. for a lot of the year as well. Well, I got to ask, how many countries have you been to? So the goal is all 193, 196, depending on who you ask. (laughs) And I have visited 61 as of this spring. Oh, my gosh. Well, what has been your favorite, least favorite? I mean, I know that's a loaded question. Depends on food and climate and a lot of things. But let's maybe go top three to five that you've been to. Top three to five. So I think the dopest, like people and partying and food like that solid mixture of those and like great weather too is lebanon oh wildest parties i've ever been to in my life were in lebanon like in the suburbs of beirut it was wild again great mix of people and food and weather is brazil love brazil what i love about brazilians is like they want to talk i learned portuguese so fast because brazilians just want to communicate and that's great um Earlier this year, I visited Laos for four days while I was living in Vietnam. And like, Laos is so quiet. It's like when you walk out of a club and it's like, like, <laughs> like <laughs> that is, yes. that feeling is Laos. Um, it's just a quiet, peaceful, beautiful, lovely place. Um, that said, Vietnam this year, I was there for a month back in 2019. I will maybe probably go back for three months again this year. I'm just kind of obsessed right now. The food is so good. It's inexpensive. It's easy to get around. The technology is crazy. So it's wicked easy to do your job. Um, The only downside being it's a 12-hour time difference from the U.S. Mm -hmm. So it just depends. I mean, it depends on your job. Like if you need to take meetings, then maybe Vietnam is not for you for three months. (laughs) But... If you can be really flexible with your schedule and take maybe two days of meetings first thing in the morning or late at night, then you can make it work. Wow. This is amazing. Now, I'm sure the questions you always get asked is, do you ever get lonely? Do you worry about the culture difference, the language difference? I mean, what has been your experience in 61 countries? Um, Yes, I do get worried. But no, I don't think I get as worried as like your average person who thinks that like Mexico is scary. Um, Most people in most places are truly looking out for you. And I will say, yes, even if you're American, even if you're affiliated with, um, I have a lot of friends who are in the military and like, yes, even if you're in the military, people do not care in the same way that like, if you were at your gym and you met somebody from all name names, Russia, you're not going to judge them for being Russian. Right. You're not going to not be their friend just because our president and their president and the politics and whatever. Like happy, right? <laughs> no, she's probably going to be a really dope workout partner. And the same thing goes for when you're in another country. Like if you're just out walking around and you're being kind and curious and not making yourself a target, then people are probably going to be pretty cool to you. I've never had anyone target me for being American. I think that as a woman traveling alone, there's certain precautions that I take, but that's pretty simple. Um, As far as like somebody always knows where I am. I do love staying in group situations like hostels and things, especially in like women's only rooms or in co-working. There's also co-living spaces for digital nomads where you check in for a month, but it's like a house and you get your own room and maybe your own bathroom and then it's a bunch of people who are there longer term so you create relationships so that prevents loneliness as well so there's a lot of support out there for term travelers and i think like i said just making educated decisions you know i'm not gonna go get super drunk and walk around outside alone at night but i'm also not gonna do that in san francisco exactly right so like what does it matter if i'm in like 
Cape Town or Cape Cod. It really doesn't. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> Maybe that'll be the title of your episode. We'll see. Okay. Now, building a business while on the road. I mean, quite literally, quite frankly, on a plane. I mean, I know how difficult it can be, but it's funny because whenever I travel, and you are much more travel than I am, and I want to be when I grow up, but it's funny because first thing I pack is always like laptop, charger, any, and my ID, anything else I could figure out. And that's funny on any trip or when people are like, oh my gosh, I forgot my laptop. I'm like, can't relate. That's like the child that comes with me. So how do you manage to scale and grow your business despite time zone differences? Or how do you kind of work with clients and differentiate yourself in this market? All year round, no matter where I'm at, my calendar is open for very limited times. And it's typically like first thing in the morning, California time. Because that then is mid-afternoon Europe and Africa time. And I can usually catch it and stay up late if I'm in South Asia. So early mornings, California time tends to be good. So then I don't have to mess with my schedule a whole lot. And then it allows me to time block. So if I am across the pond, I work all morning. If I am here in the States, I take meetings in the morning and can work and get good work done in the afternoons. I think the biggest challenge to traveling long term is the focus, especially when you first start. So when you're used to only going on vacation, oops, I forgot my laptop or whatever it may be. For me, what I do to prevent that is I always travel with, of course, my computer, but also a second screen and a mouse. Yes. Like those things that just make work a little bit easier. I have a little portable. It's the size of my laptop screen. It folds up like my laptop. So it's really low profile. It's like 80 bucks on Amazon. It's a second monitor that's portable. It's super easy. It's great. The mouse makes working a lot easier than for personal. I also stick to waking up at more or less the same time every day, you know, between six and eight. Um, I travel with my yoga mat and my memory foam pillow because I think it's important to be able to center in the same place every day. I'm not super athletic. I'm not a big yogi. It's just a habit that helps like bring those daily touch points no matter where you are. And then the memory foam pillow, I'm theoretically sleeping in the same place every night. So I create these consistent experiences no matter where I am. And that helps a lot with focus, both with building a business and with leading a consistent lifestyle because I'm not on vacation. I'm just not at home. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. And I want to get to your story of quitting because I'm curious about it from the email you sent me. So we have to go over that. But before we touch <laughs> okay. that, how do you find these clients or, you know, miss each other if you're 12 hours ahead in Vietnam and, you know, we're playing email tag and trying to kind of close those clients? How does that work for you? Yeah. So I have a lot of systems in place that really help me. So I have an onboarding document where people, before we ever talk, just fill out a form and tell me a little about themselves. So that way we el not eliminate the get to know you conversation, but we have a basis for a conversation. And I can also say, hey, this probably isn't worth our time. Or if they need something done tomorrow, I'm just not that person. I'm a holistic service provider, not a Fiverr or Upwork person. And that's a great place to start. It's just not where I'm at anymore. So I'm not a task rabbit. I am a professional and we develop those professional relationships and my systems help me a lot. Also, I'm flexible. If I need to stay up a little later or get up a little earlier when I'm out of the country, I understand that working with Americans and also earning American dollars, like I could take on cheaper clients if I wanted to work with people from other countries, but I don't. So I need to be flexible. And I understand that. And I understand that to have my cake and eat it too, I have to be flexible. But otherwise, it's the same working relationship. It just means I never, ever, and I don't think I would do this even if I was 100% US based, I never give out my phone number. It is never expected that you should be able to get a hold of me at a moment's notice because your lack of planning is not my emergency. So I just build client relationships the same way. But we have to understand that if you need something, it's totally normal to wait like 12 hours to get an email back. <laughs> That's still not that big of a deal. So in conclusion, all yes. that to say, it's literally the same as if I were US based. But I also do build out a lot of systems to support me. And I do have an assistant who is based on the East Coast. So when needed, she taps in for some client communications or she'll help like filter things for me if I need it. Nice. So going back to the you quitting your job, 
What got you to the point where you're like, you know what, I'm going to do my own thing because I want to hear that story and how you ended up quitting and kind of what you felt through that process. Yeah. So to go back to like when I was in college and realized that I was I knew I could do things differently. I knew that that meant that I probably wouldn't be in a corporate role forever. I just didn't know what it looked like for me. Um, Honestly, as that came into like gaining some shape over the years that I was in a sales career, I was in finance sales, then I went into tech hardware sales, then into tech software and tech research sales. So I was very much a tech bro. (laughs) Um, I became that person. But I started to think that because selling intangible products is so difficult that I would end up being a sales consultant or something like that. I started to play with that idea. I also thought that maybe my blog would take off. Side note, it didn't. That blog is now defunct. Oh. So don't you don't have to go looking for it. I w- I'm a failed blogger and that's okay. It got me here. It's okay. So what did that journey look like? I knew that I wanted to do it differently. I started flirting with different ideas and I had actually, so early 2019, my company asked me to move from Florida to Texas. And I said, yes. And I said, yes. And I will likely quit at the end of the year. I communicated that to my boss. I was like, I would love to go to Texas. I'd been living in Fort Myers, Florida, which is a great place to vacation, but I was 27 and single. So I was like, not a great place to be. I, I'll be back in 50 years. It's fine. <laughs> we have family down there and I'm like, wow, I'm the youngest one down here by decades. So, yep. Yeah, it was great. I loved living there. I knew it wasn't a forever thing. I wanted out. They were willing to help me get out. And I said, OK, but like, I do think that my entrepreneurial career is coming unless you can let me go remote. And they're like, "Nah, I can't do that. So I moved to Dallas and I asked again the following quarter, can I go remote? And they were like, no, you can't do that. And I said, okay, I'm taking two weeks off in July. I'm going to go to Southeast Asia. I'm leaving my computer at home. See you in a couple weeks. I accidentally checked my work email in my time abroad and just got this slew of messages that I was like, this is all bullshit. (laughs) Like none of this is fun. I have been planning my exit strategy anyway. I was living with, I was rooming with a girl from work. So my computer was there. And so I called my boss and I said, hey, I'm going to stay in Vietnam for a while. And she was super stoked, super proud of me. She knew what my goals were. She knew that I didn't want to stay with the company, that I didn't want to continue through a management track or whatever. So she was like, I admire your courage. I'm so stoked for you. Uh, can your roommate bring in your computer? That's the only thing I see upper management coming after me for. And I was like, yeah, I'll tell her to bring it in on Monday. So I ended up staying in South Asia with no computer. And I feel like that's important because I stayed in South Asia for another two months after that. Wow. I finished up my visa in Vietnam, moved to Thailand, and then spent some time in Hong Kong before coming back to the States and learned how to dive and started reading again, like just all these things that I didn't think I had time for. And then after I got my first two diving certifications, I was like, maybe I become a dive instructor. That never happened. But what did happen is I checked into an internet cafe one afternoon and sent an email to about five people who I just knew had businesses and knew that they knew me. So it was uncles and friends and neighbors and mentors from college. And I sent an email to all of them individually, but the gist of each email was, hey, I'm a free agent. I should probably start making money again soon. I took a bit of a sabbatical here in Asia. I'll head back to the States next month and I'll have access to a computer. But if you have any work for me in the meantime, please let me know. And that's when those people either hired me or referred me. And that's that's truly the impetus of the business. It's funny because you are not the first person to say I went through, I had a guest who went through her whole phone book and if she didn't feel comfortable sending someone a message, she deleted their number. And then, so that was interesting. And that's how I started my business too, was blasting it to friends and family. And I think a lot of people don't realize the whole like, I hate the word network, but like use your network or like use your people because they can be the ones that are in the rooms you're not in or halfway across the world Yeah, and can say, oh, I got Sam, like she's the best copywriter and this is what you need. You need to work with her and do that. Mm -hmm. 
I love that that's a big part of your story because people don't realize, I mean, that's where you start. Like the people that I'm sure you face the same thing of like, oh, you're really going to do that. You're really going to go across the world. You're crazy. You're nuts. I'm sure you've heard it all. How did you stay kind of stuck? I like to, I love the word tenacious. Like that's my favorite, one of my favorite words. But how did you stay kind of tenacious and like set in your ways and saying like, yeah, I'm doing this and I don't really care what you have to say about it? Yeah, I think part of that was conditioning from the sales job because it wasn't cold calling. It wasn't, you know, the door to door people who are trying to get you to put solar on your roof, which is fine. Like I admire the hustle. It was not what I was doing. But I think being in sales helped me understand that like closed mouths don't get fed. And that if I didn't want to go back to work. So the way I saw it was I had some money saved up. I had been in sales, right? So I was getting these bonuses and I was stashing them away. So I had some runway and I was like, worst case scenario is six, eight months go by and I go back to work. But if I can get any work now, that'll just extend the runway and I don't have to go back to a job. Because I, I, I was a top performer on my team. I had the numbers. I had the resume to show. Like, I can get a job. I just didn't want one, <laughs> especially one that was going to tell me, no, you can't go travel. So I think it was that. I think it was that carrot in front of me of like, the more that I earn, the longer I can go without having to go back to work. And then it was like, well, wait. I'm four months in and I'm now earning more than I'm spending each month. And then it was like, well, now I'm earning enough to start contributing to my own retirement accounts and earning enough to save. You know, like now we're looking really far out to a point that it's like, I just don't see myself ever being an employee again. You know, and it's been five years. So also I'm conditioned to this is my new normal after this much time. It is. It's not always easy. It's I think a lot of people I just got dinner with a client turned friend turned she I've told her for three years she should be an entrepreneur. She's finally like, hey, girl, I think I'm ready now. But I'm like, I can't give you any groundbreaking advice. It's just like rip the freaking bandaid off and do it. And I think it's staying consistent. And oh, before I forget, your Instagram, I think, is the most gorgeous Instagram I've ever seen in my freaking life. Let's <laughs> I don't know. I totally forgot to start there. I shared it with my employees. I'm like, look at Samantha's Instagram. She is queen of it. Like amazing. 30 out of 10. Like you're listening to this. Go to the show notes and check out her Instagram because it's incredible. But as you learned, I mean, I don't know if you were a social media person before, but of course, being a business owner on top of traveling, on top of everything. How do you kind of like gain this expertise and just kind of, for lack of a better term, like roll with the punches or the ever-changing environment, throw a pandemic in there, you know, all the things that have happened the last five years? How do I deal with it? So (laughs) crying? I don't know. Oh my God, I love a good cry. (laughs) Yes, I'll call you during my next one. (laughs) Yeah, but you know, I mean, I tell this story every so often that when I was in sales for my final company that I was with, I was in kind of a mentorship leadership position and we had moved into a new office and the windows on the conference rooms hadn't been frosted yet. So you they were just fishbowls. And I was like, oh yeah, I said something just offhand as I was showing these new women who had joined the company around. And I was like, yeah, once they frost the glass for those conference rooms, you can use them for calls or crying, whatever you need to do. And like joked around with it. And they're kind of like, what? And it's funny because I'm still friends with both of those women. One of them still with the company. One of them moved on soon after I did. But we laugh about that still to this day of like, they were fresh out of college. They were so green, so optimistic. They were like, why would I cry at work? Oh, sweetheart. And it's like, well, you're going to cry because you're a human. And sometimes people are nice. Sometimes people are mean. Sometimes you just need to cry. And this isn't a conversation that we had then, but realizing it now and looking back, I would rather cry because things are hard and it's like in my weird little bedroom office than cry in a conference room. And when things are hard, when there's a pandemic outside, when there's somebody who's breathing down my neck, somebody who's not respecting boundaries and I don't have a manager that can step in for me. It's like, well, this is the heart that I choose. Wow. That was amazing. Now, 
as we wrap this up, what advice do you have for listeners? Your brain is the greatest asset that you have. Invest in it. Coming off of corporate, especially like when I learned about business coaching and how much it costs, I was like, what the heck? I had never invested money like that in myself. I was still trying to scrounge by on my $20 a month gym membership. That was the money that I invested in myself. Everything else, I was just buying things, right? I was buying a car and clothes and stuff. And as a business owner and as somebody who's, whether or not you want to be a business owner, if you're investing in your personal development, maybe that's a financial investment. Maybe it's a time investment, but don't sleep on it. Investing in your mindset is more than just following Jocko Willink on Instagram or listening to a podcast, which are great, but truly taking the time to like decide what you want and figure out what it looks like to go after it and not shying away from the fact that it might mean additional certifications and education. It might mean working with a therapist or a coach or a business mentor, but that investment in the asset of your brain, whether that's your mindset or your education, I think is invaluable. I think you're the first person to give that advice in 130 some episodes. That's a great one. And also stay hydrated. <laughs> stay hydrated. <laughs> Can relate as my uh, partner calls it my adult sippy cup that I have. So yep, you got one too. Yep. Sam, you've been absolutely incredible. If you're listening to this, you want to work with Sam, you want to see her journey, see all the badassery that she is, head to the show notes and tune in again next week for another episode of That's Business. That's Business.